please join me in giving them a massive round of applause as we welcome our wonderful panel onto the stage. Right, well, thank you very much, Teresa, and thank you, everybody at the Extreme Hangout, for letting us uh, take the stage today to discuss a topic that may sound quite niche and quite dry, but actually is one of the most important uh, factors in driving down the emissions of a $2.5 trillion sector that is on track to double its emissions as opposed to bring them down by 2030. Uh, there are many roles to play in, in driving down this gross amount of pollution to people and planet and devastation, but policy and legislation is one of them, and youth agendas are one of the things that are going to help drive that change. So could you all introduce yourselves and let us know not only who you are, what you do, but what was your call to action to drive purpose and impact to make the world a better place, and why you're here at COP? Daniel, I'll start with yourself. Well, thank you very much for having me, Mary. Um, so I'm Special Advisor to the United Nations on Sustainable Finance, but I'm not taking this gig in an official capacity. I'm actually here as Chair of Resilient Cities Network, which is a network of 100 mayors, 100 cities all over the world in 40 countries, each of whom is highly committed to the resilience agenda. And I accepted the invitation because I think urban solutions to this particular problem are very important. Maybe we'll get a chance to get onto that. You asked me my personal call to action. Mm -hmm. um, I benefited um, from charity when I was very young through my education. Um, and you know, my origins are relatively humble. Um, first person in my family ever to finish high school and go to university. Um, that made a big difference for me. And I love learning, and I love teaching, and I'm very, very keen to give back. Um, what I particularly like about the Sustainable Development Goals is goal number 17, which is partnership for the goals. And COP for me is about partnership. It's about bringing people together. It's about convening, um, not just those nation states that are signatories to what is a very important treaty that's being hammered out mm -hmm. um, every year, but the wider community and that's why I'm grateful to you and to Extreme Hangout for creating a space which brings in everybody to the conversation. Brilliant and one last thing I'm going to ask all of you to touch on is where we are today what gives you hope for a better future? This, speaking from the heart right now what comes mm. to mind is this like the energy here Amen. I can't solve this but we are the solution and the youth is a solution, and seeing the people here that are energised in this conversation, that gives me hope. That's one. I feel slightly emotional. Um, Julia, tell us. Yeah, hi Mary. Thank you so much, Extreme, for having us here today. Um, so I'm Julia. I'm here with One Young World this week, um, and we do a lot of work on climate advocacy at the local, national and international level. And I usually try and thread in a little bit of a textiles perspective in, in those conversations, because that's where my background's in, having spent the past five years um, in the fashion industry, first for a, a French luxury brand, um, and now working for an NGO. Um, so with, with Mary, we, we love having these little conversations on, on policy and, and what we can do, we do indeed. and how can we move things forward. Um, what put me in this space and wanting to be making a difference? Um, I mean, there are lots of reasons, uh, but one is my mum's Indian. And I remember being in school around the age of 13, 14, and having a Skype call with my cousins. We don't really do Skypes anymore now, <laughs> uh, but Skype back then. Um, and my cousins couldn't go to school uh, because of the pollution peaks in Delhi. And over the years, those calls with my cousins that have now shifted to Zoom calls and Teams calls and WhatsApp calls have gotten more and more frequent uh, as to why they can't go to school. Sometimes it's because of extreme weather conditions. So it's because the pollution peaks have just gone more and more frequent. Um, and I'm quite fortunate because I was never at that end of the phone call conversation telling them I can't go to school either. Um, and I feel very, very blessed and privileged uh, to be in that position. Okay. So I just felt, you know, I, uh, mm. I also need to do a little bit my my piece of the puzzle there. Interesting. Both of you, these are personal things coming from a long time ago. And Julia, one last thing. What gives you hope at the moment? What gives me hope is all the kids I've spoken to at COP this week... Mm. There are so many here. We had the youth choir um, at Extreme a few nights back, um, which is absolutely lovely. And seeing their level of engagement on the topic, um, 
the progress from an educational perspective that's been made there as well. I just feel like there are so many buzzing ideas coming um, and from all generations. Mm. And that cross-generational dialogue, I think, is, is really important to, to move things forward. Thank you very much. Clara, last but not least, thank you for coming. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Extreme Hangout, for this amazing stage. I think it's one of the, I told the team, one of the most interesting ones, if not the best for me. Um, so it's a privilege to be here. Um, I'm Clara. Um, I'm from Spain. And I'm a climate activist and nature and animals advocate. I'm a U.S. Climate Pact Ambassador and Next Gen Assembly by GFA. And on those roles, basically, I try to advocate for solutions, climate change. I try to raise awareness through social media. And I try to have conversations on these privileged um, opportunities that uh, sometimes they give us to you know, like try to push for more action when we have the chance to talk with policymakers mm -hmm. or with CEOs. Um, also, I'm a fashion model, so that's my relation with fashion. And I love also like to work from the inside because I'm not like agree at all about how this industry works. So I'm always trying to bring the conversations to places where these conversations would not happen, as mm. even like studios or when I meet the clients when I'm working uh, with them. So just trying to plant the seed on everyone's mind about my concerns and what drives me. Uh, that was the second question, what yeah. called myself to action. Mm -hmm. Basically, I've been very connected to nature and animals all my life, but I guess uh, since I was a teenager and when I started to modeling, somehow I forget that kind of connection because I was mm -hmm. just blinded by the lights somehow. Yeah. So by, by the awareness that I started to have and the research that I started to make about this industry, about climate change, I just started to be aware of all the destruction that is happening to what I care the most or what I used to care the most, which mm -hmm. is biodiversity, animals, nature, uh, forests, and also to understand the social impacts of this industry. Mm -hmm. uh, that just got me shocked when I, I understood the social and environmental consequences of the industry that I was part of. So I tried to educate myself and educate others uh, on this aspect because I think it's very relevant. And otherwise, fashion just stay on like a superficial and yeah. cool level. Yeah. Um, It'll just carry on business as usual. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Well, I think um, there's a context that we'd like to map out here is that, that fashion has had this brilliant ability to have this kind of adjacent mentality for so long, right? It's always evaded scrutiny. It's quite often you talk to politicians and they're just like, oh God, apparel, textiles, fashion, so, you know. And um, so it's not only imperative to start really bringing it to the policy agenda, but I think the other thing I want to talk to all of you about is what's particularly interesting to me is that if we look at the last, say, 10 years in fashion, You've seen branding and marketing and product skew very hard towards your generation, towards youth. It's the aesthetic and the design, the aesthetic of their communications and the design of a lot of their products have really skewed towards a very typically millennial, Gen Y, Gen, Gen Z kind of taste. And yet, A, that means that it's fashion is not inclusive because it's not targeting actually some of its core uh, target addressable market, which is people, say, between 30 to 50 or 60 or 70 who have a lot more disposable income and who don't see themselves in the brand or in the product. But equally, what's doubly wrong about this is that it's like, do you know what? We will essentially go and mine youth culture for what we think will sell back to them, but what we won't do is also address their actual needs in the mm. process. That, to me, is the big paradox that it. it's like, cool, we'll do lo like a luxury fur house from Rome that's been around for 300 years. Let's make sneakers. Let's just make sneakers, right? Like, that's what the kids want. But yet, we know what else they want. But that doesn't matter about the climate piece and making the future better for them. It's, that's somebody else's problem, right? So with that in mind, um, Daniel, I'd love to hear your point of view about um, what, when you've got an industry like this that is, is behaving in a way that is so irresponsible, deliberately and partly out of ignorance or deliberate ignorance, what would you advise, having sat between both the private sector and the policy-making space? That's such a big question. It is. Um, can I just start by 
making two points. Mm. One is there isn't one fashion industry. Right? I'm not a fashion expert, but you mentioned luxury brands, mm. um, but also we have the fast fashion brands as we well. We do. Right? And we need to, if we're looking for solutions, I think we need to segment the industry into its constituent parts because mm. they're motivated in slightly different ways. Mm -hmm. The second thing I want to say is, while I agree with, I think, the hypothesis that underpins your framing, mm. the fashion industry has been trying, um, and whether it's um, the UN Global Fashion Compact, yep. um, there have been moves in the right direction, and I think, yeah. I make those two points, because if we're going to try and solve anything, one, we need to understand that segmentation and make sure that we're working with the different constituents of the mm -hmm. industry in the right way. Mm -hmm. And two, we need to meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. And they are trying. How do we reach out and say, well done? Mm -hmm. And how do we pull it forward? Mm -hmm. um, so those are just general tactics mm -hmm. for engagement. When I think about... When I think about how you move... And I think you, and how you build change, I think you need to operate at different time horizons as well. Mm -hmm. I think there are some quick wins that we can deliver on, mm -hmm. but I also think we need to be in it for the long run. And I know that's hard because we all want change now. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes get frustrated myself with sometimes decadal processes, mm. you look at Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals, and we've bitten off something and set ourselves targets, and we're at the halfway point, mm -hmm. and there's still many more years to go. And that can seem very frustrating, given the urgency. Mm -hmm. Equally, given the scale of the problem, we need to be working on that arc. Mm. Um, and so, when I put my UN hat on, not that I'm wearing it today, I think about the convening power mm. of intergovernmental communities. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be at COP were it not for UNFCCC, which mm -hmm. convenes everybody, but also the convening power of philanthropy, the convening power of big business, um, the convening power of different governments, bring people together, and I think you mentioned advocacy. I often get a bit wearied by advocacy. You research and then you promote um, because I've spent my career in the private sector and it's quarterly targets and I want mm -hmm. action now. But I think we need to recognize we want both at the same time. So segment the audience that you're talking to, mm -hmm. meet them where they are mm -hmm. and run parallel processes that are long-term and strategic but also quicker wins. They're kind of slight, they're some of my framings for how I would approach such a problem. Is that helpful? Brilliant. Yeah, 100%. Um, and um, when it in, com in terms of whether it's quicker wins now or longer term, as you mentioned, policy and legislation has a role to play in that. And Julia, um, as we know, fashion is producing 100 billion garments a year on track to double its emissions, and uh, three out of five garments are destined to landfill within a year. You didn't come from fashion originally. You were in DC working in the energy and policy sector, and then you've now moved into luxury and fashion. Why did you, A, why did you choose to do that? And B, with reference to what Daniel mentioned, what needs to change near, medium, and longer term when it comes to policy and legislation to try and solve this problem, do you think? Yeah, I mean, obviously in terms of, of acting now, um, COPs have been around for basically as long as Clara and I, since we've been born pretty much. <laughs> yeah. we've, um, we've had COPs uh, pass through all, all our lives. So I think definitely uh, there's, there's some time needed here to get there and deliver it concretely. And that's a little bit why I moved into the fashion world. Um, I love DC. I had incredible, incredible experiences there and fascinating conversations. But there did come a point at which I felt um, you were talking about concrete actions in the private sector. I a little bit wanted to add my piece to the puzzle on that side. Um, and I felt that that's where, where some things need doing. Um, and very much in the fashion industry because we are an industry with, with a platform and people look a lot at what we do. Mm. Um, and definitely in Europe, I think we're, we're really 
ahead of the curve now with the European Green Deal, um, with so much legislation coming to push more and more information to the consumer, right? You've got green claims, empowering consumers for the green transition, the eco-design regulation, all these texts are there to make sure that more information is brought to the consumer that is transparent, verifiable, and traceable. And brands are having to say more and more about where they're producing, what they place on the market, what its impact is. You know, you've got work going on at the moment in Brussels on what's called a product environmental footprint. So the idea of that is that you will be able, in a couple of years' time, when the product is put on the market, to know exactly what its impact is. You've got it a little bit already in the food industry with the Nutri-Score, you know, green, mm -hmm. orange and red. Mm. Um, but that's in the EU. Um, and that's where we come to the challenge with policy that you need to have harmonized initiatives across markets mm -hmm. so that we don't have a situation where, great, in France we've got legislation now, we've got the French circular economy law, we've got the climate resiliency law, but in the UK we're lacking that piece still. Mm. And how do we get to a point where policy is harmonized across these markets and putting those requirements out for brands across the markets because they all operate globally at mm. the end of the day? Thank you so much. And, um, building on that, Clara, obviously you work with the EU, you're active in the policy space, you're a model, you work in fashion, and you also represent your generation, your cohort, your community. With what Julia's just touched on, where there is legislation coming down the line, do you feel that is a enough? How does it make you feel, both from someone who understands a bit about policy, but it also speaks to your own community who want that change? Does it give you hope, or does it make you think that... It's well, how do you feel about that? Well, I think, yeah, definitely wins have happened on the last uh, years because um, I've understood uh, or I know that some policies are happening uh, related to sustainable fashion on the European umbrella, and that's definitely like a win. Mm. But talking about the speed that we were talking, I really don't understand how... Um, I'm not an expert on on the system of how policies or laws are made in terms of time. Because um, what I feel is, for example, uh, there is a European uh, directive, I think, there is uh, tackling, well, the, capa the capability of, of um, clothes to be recycled and mm -hmm. they need just to meet like, some requirements to be able to market them on the, on the European Union, right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't like, comply those requirements, you will not enter, which is fantastic, but still, like, it's going to happen, like, I think in, um, I don't know if it's that one or it's other related to social yes, issues. Yeah. yeah, there are a few, but yeah, yes. But they are taking time, you know, like, they are, like, probably be uh, happening in four years. So I don't really know if it's being tackled, like, the emergency of the issue in climate change in general, environmental and social impacts. Because, mm. I mean, we have seen with other types of uh, circumstances as COVID, you know? COVID was sure. emergency and the policies and laws were yep. like practically Solutions. on time, yeah. you know, like very yeah. quick. Because that was yeah. an emergency. And why yeah. we are not able on the policy space to, you know, make those changes a little bit fa faster. Because, um, yeah, I don't think the, the emergency is seen there, you know, okay. as it should. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think, like, people, for example, from Ghana, where all these uh, clothes are dumping on landfills, I don't think, mm -hmm. like, the biodiversity that is being, uh, like, destroyed by this industry, mm -hmm. um, all of these impacts can, like, really wait for years even, yeah. you know, because it's, this is an everyday thing, you know, and it's happening okay. every day. Yeah. But uh, from my perspective, I think something that is really driving change um, it's us. I mean, it's, it's the advocacy, you know, okay. and the activism. I really believe that all these policies are happening somehow because they were incubated by activism. All okay. the, like, policies that are happening come... I, I want to believe that come from a revolution uh, movement, uh, protest, you know, like, activism okay. somehow is like a driving force and you need to go for these systemic changes Great. Uh, with the people in the ground. And I yeah. think young, young people, by protesting, by raising awareness, by just, even as consumers, choosing different, mm -hmm. we are advocating for the changes that we want to see. And I don't think like these policies would be yeah. now discussed if these movements and young people is advocating for those, you know? Because now we have more awareness and more information mm -hmm. than before. And I think we are a little bit more caring about 
the environmental and, and social aspects that so many years ago were not even on the table. We didn't Good. know where our things are coming from and yeah. we didn't care. So I think I have hope in the next generation. Okay. So in, in that respect, you speak for potentially some or a lot of your community and that you feel that your voices are being heard and that they are somehow being listened to and then there is action being taken on the basis of that. A little bit. That's good to hear. Yeah. Good to, we're going to come on to that later because there's some other things I want to talk to you about. But Daniel, I know you had something to say on this matter uh, as well. Well, there's, there's so much that you said there that I would love to pick up on, but I don't want to dominate. But we could talk about activism and the role of youth voices in driving change if we wanted to. Mm. I think there's a really interesting compare and contrast with the pandemic if you want to go there. I think it's also really interesting to think about some of the words we're using. I don't think we're using any technical language, but I've heard policy, regulation, legislation, mm -hmm. litigation. These are all different things and thinking yeah. about how they come together in order to drive change. Mm -hmm. um, if we wanted to unpack that a little mm -hmm. bit, we could talk about that. So not I would I'm not sure where you want to go. No, no, I would love to do that, especially with your guidance as an expert in this and to an extent Julia's as well, how we can not just look at that in, in terms of itself as a, th as a set of theories or, or mechanisms, but what they actually mean for younger people who would be tuning in today and people like Clara and Julia's age, age range and what that means for them and how they can engage with them successfully as opposed to feel that they are outside of that or that it's something that other people do in other rooms that they are not connected to. So let us start with the first point I made about youth activism, but mm. bringing it to this, because you talked mm. about engagement, mm -hmm. these words like policy, it's an abstract noun, mm -hmm. how do I get involved in policy? Mm -hmm. So yesterday was Sunday, but it was also International Human Rights Day, mm -hmm. and it was the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, and Article 21 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is on participation. Mm -hmm. It's a fundamental right for all humans to be able to participate in the processes and the systems that shape their world. Now, I know we are maybe in a youth forum and we're having a youth conversation, but it's not just youth. It mm. could be those who are able-bodied and those who are less able-bodied, mm. those who are old, those who are young, those who are male, those who are female, yeah. those who are indigenous, those from the developed world, whatever it happens to be. Um, but I think it's really apposite that we're having this conversation right now mm. about engagement and about activism um, because if you think about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, what it is, is a blueprint for legislation. Mm. Most international law, national law, follows those principles. And even if you think about the SDGs, they built on those as well. So I just wanted to bring that into the conversation mm. that it's a fundamental human right. And it's right that you grab it and you do something with it, but it's also right that there are fora that mm -hmm. enable that. This is one of them, but you think about, I don't know, youth parliaments around mm -hmm. the world. Just because you're not old enough to vote yet doesn't mean you can't participate in the process mm -hmm. um, and it behoves us slightly more grown-up people who can change the uh, environment with, through, through their voice to create forum that enable that engagement. And if it's not there, then you have to agitate for it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can be an activist, and you mentioned some of the things that you do where you are part of, if you like, formal participatory youth yeah. platforms, and there's your own... Um, rebellious way of doing mm -hmm. that through your own voice on your social media platforms. And we need to, we need to be doing both. You did ask me a question, though, about these abstract words of policy. Yeah, and I don't know if you want me to carry on speaking or whether we should let some other people respond, because I don't do want to say what, too much. What do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with, with Clara's point on that legislation does need to move faster and faster, mm. and, and it does because ultimately... We don't really have time to keep talking about it. No. <laughs> but um, having also witnessed some of those negotiations, it is also really crucial that those texts are written properly. Um, and you have to be careful when it's written too hastily that sometimes there'll be conflicting obligations. We had a situation a few years ago in France with something called the green dot, which is basically a little green dot on your packaging that says that that product can be recycled. And then we had a situation across the EU where in some countries that green dot was mandatory and in other countries 
you were fined if you placed that green dot on your packaging <laughs> because it was considered misleading information for the consumer because there were too many other pieces of information on your packaging. God. So for producers, it became, what do I do? Do I put the green dot on all my packaging mm. and then I accept that in some markets I'm going to be paying a fine and not in mm. others? Or not do I produce altogether. different types of packaging for mm -hmm. different markets, which is a nightmare? How, how do you solve that? The green dot eventually got completely removed and it's now no longer mandatory anywhere. But that's an example where policymakers weren't really speaking enough and things moved too quickly mm -hmm. and you had a very counterproductive measure in place. So you also need to take the time for the right conversations to happen at the right mm -hmm. level so that legislation as enacted is also effective yeah. and does what it needs to and be doing. And thought through properly. Yeah. That's a good point to make because of this sense of urgency we've talked about. Yeah, it I just wanted to add, um, sorry, to what you said, um, Daniel, about, um, you know, like having spaces for youth to act actively participate. Because I believe that, yeah, I have the privilege to, as a next gen and as a youth climate pact ambassador, to have this. And I thought that was making like a huge change. So, of course, in one, in one side, I believe that these spaces are necessary and we need more, you know, for young people to actively participate on the policy making and everything. Uh, but on the other hand, I see and I've realized in these two years that many of these spaces are just like uh, fake scenarios to a feel good thing about them, about the, you know, CEOs or companies or whoever like is organizing this. And on the other hand, also to feel good about, okay, I'm a young person and I'm being hurt, but actually, like, is, is something else going to happen? Like, I don't want you, I don't want people just to hear me and clap me and have the video and the picture and everything. And it seems like I'm making a change because I've experienced that. I've been in so many places and it seems like you are like doing something because important people is listening to you. But that's different mm -hmm. of really like taking like actionable actions yes. on, on that aspect and something okay. that, that I have an example of how to do that. Let's hear that. Yeah, um, basically Anna Kellers, I don't, I don't really know uh, her, specifically her role, but she's someone important on the, on the government of New York and she's uh, on charge of the Fashion Act, mm -hmm. okay, one policy, one policy that they are trying to develop in terms of uh, uh, companies to be more accountable and yeah. everything, right? So she invited us, after having the Global Fashion Summit in Copenhagen, she invited us to share a WhatsApp group and have like some really? meetings with her to literally like go like line by line with this directive, okay? And involve us on the process and we could make like comments on each line because at the end we are able as young people also, mm -hmm. although we don't have the full understanding of all the systemic changes that you need to do, you mm. know, in order to change a company or whatever, we are able to think out of the box. So we are going to be more critical. Mm -hmm. You know, we have that critical thinking that sometimes yeah. it's, it's uh, not on everyone's mind. So by doing that and by making those comments, and she was like, yeah, well, this is perfect. I didn't think about this. Uh, this is not possible. You know, really? having that conversation, you are literally making us part of a policy that hopefully on, on some years mm -hmm. is going to become, you know, like uh, binding. So I think that's a way to do it. Like, I mean, that's a very engaged and very exactly. direct route and pipeline into someone with decision-making power. And that's amazing. And as you said, um, it comes with, you, you've obviously earned this amazing role for yourself and built that opportunity. But I think taking that example to both Daniel and Julia, I'd love for you to maybe help us understand how someone who isn't yet or won't, may not ever get to the position that Clara's in to be on a WhatsApp group with someone who's making these decisions, what else can they do? Because this usual thing is, oh, write your MP or take to social media, but are there case studies or examples or just guidance you could give that are likely to lead to more success and engagement um, with those that have that decision-making power around policy, legislation, regulation? Well, I think I should look at you because you're still under 30. All right. Yeah. <laughs> The uh, floor is yours. <laughs> um, I mean, I think continuously educate yourself and be at the top of the speed of that information. And don't hesitate to... Sometimes you can just even walk up to Parliament and see whoever's walking out and go and ask them questions. I did that when I was 15, 16, 17. <laughs> and, um, Great. and sometimes, actually... The person stops and says, okay, hang on, I'm, I'm going to take 15 minutes to, to listen to what you actually have to say. And then maybe, depending on how that conversation goes, that can get you into a different position. Um, but 
people that are working in this space and have a capacity to do something, you can find them everywhere. They're, they're not just at COP. They're mm. in your local town hall. They're even in your local school. They're walking around the street of your city. They're at your local market sometimes. I've had conversations um, with with people on my on my local market where, where they bring their products from and who they're in touch with to have the market stand that they have and then they get you to speak to someone else. Just talk to people. Learn, educate yourself, have facts to share and talk to people. Okay. I think the best way is engage, 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 engage. Okay. Okay. Clara, does that resonate? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I had always uh, that doubt because I, I believe that there's so many people that are not into policy or into these jargon and technical uh, languages and they have a voice as well, so how can you include them into the conversation to break that barrier? Because what I see uh, on my, you know, on my age, on the millennials, is that, okay, yeah, policymakers are here, governments are here, and we are here on the ground. How can we, you know, like, being heard on such a way when there is, like, a, mm -hmm. of course, like, a barrier there? How do you jump that, you mm. know? And also the fact that not everyone is into policy making, so mm. it would be unfair not to include the people... Uh, by instance, that is being affected by the fashion industry, um, you know, like not include them mm. in the conversation. It's like if you are trying to develop policies or directives or laws into climate change and you don't involve the people who is being more affected from the global south, indigenous communities, and you don't include them on the conversation. So I think for, for making policies and involve youth, we need to find a way to involve people that is not into the space and they don't and have And what is that though? What, what, rather than we need, what are we going to do? Yeah, and maybe that's for Daniel and Julia to chime in on as well. But I'm always about, I have a pretty strong rule on these panels. Like, we shouldn't just say, if we, if we could, we need it. It's like, what are we going to do? And what, do you see what I mean? Like, yeah, I mean, again, I think it's complicated. But I think, as I said, with the example, like, you need to give accessible education for mm -hmm. people in mm -hmm. those terms, you know, like something that they don't teach us in the school is nothing related to climate change, nothing related to policy. It's just like, you know, things that m we might not use on the future. And I think uh, it's more important, not just like, you know, like educate yourself to have a job in the future, but educate yourself. How can you like really drive a change mm. and um, having this, having more spaces, as I said before, um, with policymakers, with CEOs, breaking that barriers. And even if I don't know, you know, like, about what we are talking, okay, teach me, let's have the conversation. Because mm -hmm. when I was in Copenhagen, I didn't know, like, I, as a young activist, I just want, okay, I want this change, I want this, 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 I don't like what you're doing, but then, actually, I'm not understanding the complexity of yeah. this brand to make changes. So it's yes. good to have this conversation. Okay, you are the CEO, so teach me. What are your obstacles? What are your barriers? Because I, I really don't know. I'm not in your space. I'm on the space of a climate activist. So of course, yeah. I'm going to just push for action. Yeah, but yeah. it's good to understand and see how together we can like find a, you know, a mm. solution somehow. Thank you. Well said, actually. And, and Daniel, to that end, you know, what would you say as someone who talks to a lot of CEOs, talks a lot of very high level decision makers like is there a role to play for someone who can be an intermediary or uh, to mediate between one agenda and a very different set of, of needs which is business model transformation that takes time uh, and requires collaboration between public and private sector who's the conduit between youth advocacy and youth activism and high level decision makers to help both sides understand each other do you think I'm not sure um but I do want to pick up on something that Clara said about how to drive that change, yeah. um, which is whoever the conduit is, you need to put yourself in the shoes of the other. Yeah. You said, I don't understand. Tell me what your priorities are. What are your obstacles? Um, and so I think it begins with understanding. Um, one of my phrases is it's impossible to hate up close because once you really get to know somebody, mm. you understand that there's two, just two humans on the other side of the table and you may have very different views but you can begin to understand each other so get close mm. seek to understand and then there's fundamentally only two types of arguments the rational and the emotional mm -hmm. and try and use both tactics to drive the change I wanted to say something else you mentioned you know, Gen Y is Gen Z I want to bring in Gen Alpha and I want to Dude. bring in Gen Alpha because I think I can see th maybe three Gen Alphas in the front row. But Gen Alpha is anybody born uh, from mm. 2010 
onwards. Mm -hmm. Now, I hesitate to bring Gen Alpha in, and the reason I hesitate is because I do not want to make the climate problem the next generation's problem, right? Mm. I need to own that, you need to own that, and I can't just pass it on. No. Equally, I think something you said in your initial framing about how brands are marketing to youth yep. rather than um, necessarily the economically empowered, mm. they're getting to you sooner. Mm -hmm. We need, you said education, educate yourself, educate yourself, educate yourself. We need to be changing the dialogue for those that are at school now mm -hmm. so that they do then take on, I think you said, jobs with purpose or responsible jobs and they think about their role in the world. Mm. So I'd like to see us, of course, making change now, but one of the changes we can do now is work with the educational environment for those Gen Alphas. I think, you know, Gen Alpha, just the pure maths, is Gen Alpha is going to be the biggest generation mm -hmm. yeah. ever. Um, mm. They're going to be incredibly powerful. Yeah. Let's get to them with the right messages mm. before they are socialized or psychologically yeah. manipulated Corrupted in other directions. Exactly. Funnel, if, if anyone's watched this either here in our space or online, the, um, an NGO I had a lovely meeting with yesterday is called Fashion Takes Action, and they've created a curriculum and set of modules that can be baked into a curriculum and I think they've driven it across Canada and parts of North America but they're looking to expand that so that's just a case study to exactly to your point where if you start it you know before people are voting before they're actually spending a lot but it's true um, Julie any comments on that I think we've, we've covered, covered a lot it all here. we might close I think Teresa are we at time yeah. just one second We've got five minutes. I think what we're going to end with is some rapid-fire questions. But I know Clara's got one thing to say, but we'll make it brief because okay, I want to yeah, do some rapid-fire questions. I just wanted to, um, to add to that very quickly that um, education, I mean, like, it's kind of like a privileged thing as well, I believe, you know, because I had the time and the care to educate myself and make a deep research about the impacts that fashion has, but not everybody has, and that's mm. something that we need to take into account because, first of all, brands talking about transparency, uh, doesn't put it like easy, you know. If mm. you just go to their website, you will see. I, I in 2025, I'm gonna become neutral. Mm. I'm uh, eco-friendly. I'm uh, respecting uh, the uh, consumers. Uh, I'm doing what I can, but I'm not perfect. All these things mm. makes you, if you are not educated, makes you believe that okay, this brand is being sustainable, is mm. being accountable, and everything. Mm. So there's a lot of lack of transparency that can mislead to the people to mm -hmm. trust on that brand. So based on the, that it's a privilege to have time and to have access to internet and to so many like, you know, like mm -hmm. this type of education and research, not everybody is able to do that. So mm -hmm. that's why the pressure, it needs to be on the shoulders of companies and on the systemic change to mm -hmm. make policies that really like obligate mm -hmm. brands to really be transparent about the claims that they are doing because mm -hmm. otherwise like people who has not the time mm. you know like maybe they are like just working and with mm. they don't have the resources economic resources not even internet to understand mm -hmm. the effects of their purchases mm -hmm. yeah that's something yeah. that and why should the why should the consumer be forced to understand what bci cotton is or what oecotex or iso 9001 all these things are b2b on the whole um, a, a data set and, and who is going to be the one that helps the consumer understand what they mean in simple language where they can then drill down more if they need to but you're right traceability and transparency is critical and it often won't be the fashion industry that will be as traceable or transparent as we would like it to be because turkeys don't vote for Christmas. That's I think you've got something to say yeah. about this. There is a law around this, well, isn't there? Just to build on that, yes. No, there is, and I, I absolutely hear you, Anna, and I, I do agree on, on a lot of those points. Um, but I think we can make a quick thread back to, we, we touched earlier upon harmonisation and the importance mm. of harmonisation. And another theme to bring in there on why harmonisation is so important is it's linked with innovation because companies are Point. so much more likely to invest in research and development and find innovative new materials, more sustainable alternatives, if they know that the solution that they can put out on the market, they can put out globally without having to make any significant adjustments. So again, that brings us back to, you know, it, do, it does need to be harmonized, no fragmentation mm -hmm. for that to be done because we're talking about all these solutions 
And some of them, we've got the questions, but we don't quite have the answers yet. We need to find that new material. We need to work out how exactly to recycle this, this, and that. And there's a lot of work being put into doing that. But to really put that money where it needs to be, they also need to know that it can, it can be delivered across the market. Can I just say something quick, briefly about litigation on this? Yes, and uh, then we're going to close. OK. Um, you talked about applying pressure. Um, and one way that has been done on other industries is through strategic climate litigation. And it's strategic because you don't always believe you're going to win the case, but you bring the case, and maybe you don't win the first time or the second time or the third time, but it makes people fearful of the case, or it can change the judicial system in some way over time. Um, it's a we could have a whole conversation just about climate litigation. But I, what made me think of it, not just the urgency and the pressure, but around standardization. Because if you think about climate litigation and where it's going at the moment, it's still quite nascent, mm. and it is still digressing, diverging, in a way that is actually helpful. Meaning that the number of cases that are being brought is still increasing. The number of countries in which cases are being brought, I think there was, I counted half a dozen new countries where there was climate litigation in the last 12 months or so. Mm. The number of, and the sophistication of legal arguments that are being brought, including misinformation and disinformation, mm -hmm. um, and then where they're being brought, meaning by cities and municipalities rather than waiting for something at a nation state. Mm -hmm. These, this cacophony is, I think, going to continue and is quite helpful because then brands are feeling that it's coming at them from a lot of different directions and there isn't a place mm -hmm. to hide. But yet through legislation and innovation, we need regulation that promotes standardization around the right thing. So I think it's yeah. both and. Mm -hmm divergence and um, uh, you know, portfolio optimization by having um, multiple um, channels mm. in order to then bring people together around the right mm. answers. So I think it's a both and. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it reminds me of uh, when we were prepping this panel, we all started having conversations. I remember I put the question to both of you of, if you look at some of the successful climate litigation, what would that look like? Um, if uh, that was taken against the fashion industry for abuse of people, planet, ecosystems, biodiversity, you name it. And we haven't got time to run into that today, but uh, that is for another session, and you never know what, what may happen against some of the bigger, you know, especially the lower end of the market and what we call the volume players. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know if that gives you and your kind of generation hope that maybe that's something you'll get involved in. Um, but I think to close it would be interesting to reflect on the role of consumers versus citizens and what that means to all three of you because there's a difference between being a consumer of fashion who has, or any product or service, that has the ability to speak to the brand through social media and through other communication techniques. That's the consumer. As a citizen, you are different. You are active and you are engaged in, in more than just consuming. So what would you all three advise to anyone watching who is, especially younger audiences, but actually anyone, on the difference between being a consumer and a citizen and what the actions are for a citizen who really cares and wants to feel heard? I'm going to just quickly go first because all dichotomies are false dichotomies. Mm -hmm. They're helpful because it allows us to then, mm. as humans, get our head around things. Exactly. And while I appreciate the dichotomy, we are both at mm -hmm. the same time. And often the easiest way to be a good citizen is to vote with your feet and with your economic power by mm. being a, a good consumer. So yeah, let's separate to understand the roles that we can play, but I think mm. maybe the most powerful way is often um, citizen as consumer. Voting with your dollar, yeah. Julia? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd second that, and I'd tie it back to my earlier point of engage, engage, engage. Look, mm. look, look. Look at what you're buying. Look at the information. There might not be everything out there yet, but there is more and more. In France, there's label information now that's mentioned. The Ajax as well. Yeah, law Ajax, circular economy law. On websites, you can find more and more. We've now got, with Article 13, a set of environmental characteristics that have to be communicated for each product you place on the French market. So look, the, the information's there. And it's a two-way street, right? If brands see that consumers are looking that also pushes them in turn to place more sustainable alternatives on the market. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm agree with that um, last part. I think um, consumer. We we all are consumers and citizens at the same time. Like mm -hmm. for me, there's no difference. Like we. This system, the capitalism, works as seen as just a consumers. We are the driving force of mm -hmm. this system. So, uh, for me, there's no separation. But the problem is that as consumers, we have been shaped on a way that we are passive consumers. We are not aware about the things that we are buying, the quantity, what is behind, and that's because again, the system has created somehow this throwaway culture that uh, I used to think it was our responsibility as consumers, but actually, again, it has been shaped on a way that we feel like powerless because we are buying stuff in a passive way, like with a bandage mm. on our eyes. So I think now is emerging this movement about conscious consumer and it's, again, about transparency of, of companies and about educating ourselves if we, again, have uh, the privilege. But of course, I'm agree with the fact that if you have that privilege and you can choose better, choose better. Because every time you are, I love this quote, every time um, you are spending money, you are casting about, about you are casting a vote, vote yeah. about the world you want to you wanna make. So, yeah, if you have the chance, the time, and the care, and the interest about what is behind every time you put money on whatever you buy, and especially mm -hmm. on fashion, um, go for it. Yeah, That's very empowering. Well, I think we're at time. Thank you all very much indeed. Could we give a round of applause, please, for my fantastic panellists who have done an amazing job. Thank you, Thank you very, very much indeed. All right. Hmm? Brilliant. Are there any questions um, from the audience? I see a hand up over there. Natalia. Do we have a mic for Natalia? Thank you. Hi, everyone. What a great panel. Um, I'd like to ask the panelists um, if they've ever come across climate denial within their own families and how they've dealt with that because I would imagine that if every youth activist can deal with that successfully within their own homes and different generations we would be in a far better place. Is that for any panelists in particular or should we I'll ask? Start with the youngest <laughs> and move on up. So if I, you mean if I experience climate denial? Yes. Especially um, in your own family, in your own household. Well, in my home, actually, I'm lucky because my family have educated me since I'm a kid about the importance of nature and that connection that I have with nature and, and animals and my environment is thanks to them. So not in a close way, but um, I've experienced that on uh, from the governmental side, you know, like when actually last year, one of the ex-ministers from Spain was making like big like um, denials about climate change in a public television. And there are some things that, of course, desperate me because um, they somehow have a voice. And mm. I mean, like, you have to respect, of course, freedom of speech. You cannot, we were talking mm -hmm. as well about uh, cancel culture. Everybody has their own opinion. Everybody's free to, to spread the word. But uh, again, like, it, it happened here. We saw it even here, you know, like mm -hmm. deny, denying something that is being proved for almost the 100% of the scientific community and that is like clearly like making impacts, although maybe not in your own skin, denying in such a place as COP, you know, like, no, this is like fossil fuels are not yeah. really like impacting the climate change. Science says that like you are denying years and years of work. You are denying all the fort of indigenous communities and the people that has been impacted by those effects. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very unfair and is something that really like frustrates me a lot. And I think your question, Natalia, was but, what but have you, you been do? successful in yeah. changing someone's mindset? Yeah. yeah. Because that's what, what will give us hope. No, for real. Especially, um, actually not just in young people, because um, I, I would say in both, both aspects, like my family was not very, um, although they are like super open mind uh, and respect the environment and everything, they were not into the climate change awareness because it's something kind of new and the same with my friends and everything. So every time I have the, the opportunity to talk about these things, um, I don't find too much denial. What, what I find is just ignorance and surprise, you know, because they, they don't know about, in, st in terms of fashion, most of the people on my niche, they know. But when you go out there, most of the people, they don't know uh, what they are paying to the workers, uh, all the destruction that 
just one pants are creating that mm. just one cotton t-shirt when I say mm. this you, you need two so thousand, it's ignorant yeah, yeah. 2,000 okay. liters of water all these okay. things most of the people don't know so uh, I think I've been successful because I've been I seen during this activist journey uh, the change of behavior on so many people about the choices they make, you know, mm. especially on, on fashion. I advocate a lot for sustainable, uh, sorry, I don't like sustainable word anymore, about uh, secondhand, secondhand yeah. fashion. Um, and I think I what I'm hearing here, if I could jump in, is that yeah. to Daniel's point is which it's hard to hate someone when you're up close. I think what you, I could summarize is what you're saying is have empathy because maybe they're not actually in denial, but they exactly. just don't know. Exactly. And so once you see their position, you can then hopefully educate them positively rather than be like, oh my God, you're a denier, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Is there any other questions here? Thank you, Clara, by the way. Lady, uh, the gentleman in the, the black and white shirt there. Thank you. Thank you for correcting. I am a man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I haven't got my glasses on. <laughs> it's all so good. I got a question from Daniel because you work as a deputy of uh, director, so you must be working with a lot of CEOs and, and people in companies in high position. So how do you navigate the uh, dissonance between a sustainable future and business? Because business is for profit. So if profit is at the crux of the focus of a business, sustainability would only make sense if it connects with profit in a sunny way. And I also understand that in terms of fashion specifically, uh, when we buy products, buying in wool is a lot more sustainable financially than creating like pieces um, at creating single pieces for a limited demand. So how do you navigate those contradicting states? Great question. I didn't fully understand the second question, so I'm going to go with the first one. Um, because I, such as I understood it, I think it's bang on the right question. Um, I sometimes talk about sustainability for profit. I don't think there's a dissonance. That's how I deal with the perceived dissonance. A business model that is not sustainable is not a good business model. We shouldn't be positioning sustainability as separate from profitability. Actually, unless you build a business for the future, a business that looks after the planet and looks after your community and gives back, you will not have a business. Mm -hmm. So the way I address the perceived dissonance is by educating that there is no dissonance. And those that are on the wrong side of history, those corporations that are on the wrong side of history around sustainable development, will be the ones that become very quickly obsolete and educating that sustainability is profitability. Look at Unilever. Is the way that I tend to go about it. I don't know if that made sense. No, no, it makes a lot of sense. Does that answer Thank the you. question for you? Yeah. Is there anybody else anything to ask? Somebody at the back over there, the gentleman in the white. Thank you for... Over there. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, she didn't see me. But uh, I also had a question for uh, Daniel Stander about uh, incentivizing our way to a sustainable future. What do you think about the use of carbon credits for uh, businesses? Is that a good way for uh, the incentivizing uh, the sustainable outcome? Uh, thanks for the question. Somebody said to me this week when I was at COP that unfortunately all the answers I give are complicated ones. I don't try and make things complicated, it's just that the world is. And the answer to the, in my opinion, to the carbon credits question is a nuanced one. It's both good and bad. Right? I, ultimately, I fall on the side of, yes, let's continue to do it. Um, and I can explain why, but let me first quickly replay the argument against carbon credits. The argument against carbon credits um, is it's a way of businesses buying their way to net zero because and not doing what they should be doing themselves. Mm. It's a get out of jail card. Mm. They've made net zero pledges. They don't know how to get there, and so they buy their way to net zero, not by changing their own businesses, but by buying carbon credits. Like carbon capture storage in a way, right? Keep doing oil and gas and coal. Yeah, I can, con I can continue with my bad behaviours. I'm not addressing my own house, not getting my own house in order, and I am achieving my net zero targets by investing in other, other stuff. Mm. That is the argument against 
Mm. And that's a real argument. However, even though that argument exists, I'm broadly in favor. Because imagine you're the best company and the best intentioned company in the world, and you want to get beyond net zero, but you, there is a reality for how fast you can get there. And while you may be putting your own house in order, what can you be doing in the meantime to, be, to give back and to set yourself some targets that you can meet in other ways that then promote other activities often in the global south, um, and create value for those actions that then make those activities sustainable. And I do spend a fair bit of time thinking about, especially nature-based projects, which will deliver carbon credits and therefore value to large corporates because there's a market for it and that's a good thing. I often play that card. I'm looking to get projects funded via the carbon value, the carbon credit value. So it's nuanced. I would much prefer that we didn't need them, but if used in the right way and in harmony with positive action to get your own house in order, then I think we should support them. And I go one step further. There's actually kind of secondary markets that build up. Um, we have, there's one thing we haven't talked about, uh, and we won't be able to get into it now, but, and that's the role of insurance in all of this. Insurance is a fascinating industry, and it works as a, the canary in the coal mine sending pricing signals to big business. And one of the things that the insurance industry is doing to unlock the value of the carbon market is providing insurance back guarantees around performance delivery of projects that may look a bit too risky to invest in. Um, now, we can get into conversations, again, a nuanced conversation around moral hazard of insurance to guarantee the performance of something. I actually don't think there's a moral hazard there, but I think it's a really interesting topic that we could get more into, and it's nuanced, but fundamentally, let's not chuck the baby out with the bathwater. Let's understand it for what it is, but engage with it in the right way. Sorry for the complexity. No, I, wouldn't. I think it was very well articulated. Is there anyone else who's got anything to ask? Or are we good? Yep, the lady over there in the white. Thank you, Fro. Right, Hi. thank you so much for an amazing talk. I was just wondering, um, would you consider, um, I mean, we know that shopping second hand is more sustainable, but what about the consumerism aspect of it? I know people that feel like they're contributing to, like their tiny action to, fighting climate change by shopping second hand. However, they're very much into consumerism and they keep just buying mm. more and more. Would you consider um, second hand fashion sustainable or how can we get to change these people's mindsets to even because they already feel mm. a bit better um, since they're buying second hand, but they're not, mm. they're, they're still consuming a lot. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I'll take that one for at first, if that's all right. Because uh, for those who won't know, I wrote a white paper last year on this exact part of this exact issue about the uh, life cycle of fashion in the consumer use phase. So second hand fashion market is on course to outgrow the primary market by 2030, right? Um, it's growing exponentially. But what some platforms are doing, like Depop and Vinted, is enabling people to feel better about still consuming the same amount. So it's a good thing to consume something secondhand as opposed to something primary, which is then, you know, so it displaces a primary hand first market purchase. But if you're still consuming at the same rate, and if you're buying secondhand items that were not made well, that don't biodegrade, that shed microplastics in the ocean, that will fall apart quickly because they were badly made, then you're going to need to replace them anyway. So buying secondhand in a responsible way is about making a very discerning choice, not buying into a trend, but buying it more cheaply because it's secondhand, because you saw it on Instagram and thought, I need that giant fuchsia puff pink thing. Or Everybody's wearing brogues. Okay, whatever it is. So if you use secondhand just to try and be on trend at a better price point, that's wrong. Buying secondhand to reflect your own expression of your self-identity, of your style, is fine. But the other thing about it is you have to take care of your clothes. Consumers right now don't know how to look after their clothes, and that's not their fault because obviously the brands often don't educate them. But 
about 30% of fashion's footprint takes place in that phase, and you could bring down fashion's footprint radically by caring for your clothes, how temperatures you wash them at, making sure they don't shed microplastics, repairing your clothes, that's starting to become cool again. So it's a very complex, like to, just like Daniel's response to the um, carbon credit, it's such a complex area that. But if in doubt, buy Vinted, buy eBay, buy Depop, and it's just cooler to have something that's, um, that's second-hand, but just you look after it and you don't consume on a trend-based, frenzied way. And that's, yeah. Clara, I believe you had a point to make too. Yeah, just to add to that, I think, because, um, of course, um, I do not uh, support fast fashion anymore, and the things that I get are always, like, second-hand. But you need to be also not just, like, supporting this, but being a responsible cons consumer, right? Because the overproduction that we have is feeding back somehow the overconsumption that we have. Mm -hmm. And something that I always recommend before, okay, go for secondhand things, because as you said, like, there's a lot of people that they are just like crazy mm, consum uh, like consumer um, of Vinted and all these platforms, because at the end you can get the last, um, I don't know, like Zara uh, clothes, mm -hmm by less, less price and they are second hand because they have been used one time, but at the end it's, it's the same, right? So I always support that first and most important, the most sustainable thing you can do is use what you have. Mm -hmm. That's the most sustainable thing. And after that, if you really need something new, I will go for that or for ethical brands that are using natural fibers and being like uh, paying what they need to pay to the workers. Um, if you have the privilege to afford those, like I think uh, second hand is a, is a good way to see sustainability uh, for the people who cannot afford this new luxury and sustainable movement that is out there. But definitely use what you have, uh, upcycle what you have, you know, like if I get bored about these pants, I can cut them, just be creative because mm -hmm. that also like shape your own identity and your mm -hmm. own style instead of following on mm -hmm. trends and instant mm. gratification of all these uh, systems. So, yeah, definitely look, open your wardrobe and see what's inside mm. and create. Yeah, I think that, that makes a really nice spin with, there's another conversation that, that you're also having this afternoon more, more on that topic. On circular. Um, yeah. But yeah, don't be afraid. I mean, definitely secondhand's one thing, but also what, what Clara's just given the example of, of upcycling. You've got more and more points um, in, in various cities where you can go and take a piece of clothing and say, I don't wear this jacket anymore. Can you cut off the sleeves and make it into something new? And that can also meet your crime. Because fashion's also about creativity, you know, making a statement with how you look. But you can do that with the pieces you already have. You don't consistently have to be looking out what's a new item from this or that collection to do that. Daniel, I think you had something to say. I just wanted to say make what you have last mm. at the risk of virtue, virtue signalling. This t-shirt I bought in 2020 mm. um, and <laughs> I don't intend to replace it anytime soon. Yeah. What I, I liked... bought these in 2011, Daniel. <laughs> I was still in school sorry, and I I'm still I, wearing sorry, them. I said 2020, I meant 2000. Oh, wow. Right. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm not right. very good with numbers. All right. yeah. 2000 is when I got this. This oh, is almost, 20, 20, almost 25 years old. Do you know who made it? Yeah, I do. Who? Smedley. Very good brand. Very yeah. good brand. It also has a hole in the back, mm -hmm. but I don't... You get that repaired? No, I'm fine with You're it. fine with it. I'm yeah. fine with the hole <laughs> in the back. Um, but where I wanted to go briefly was secondhand, yes, you mentioned it, upcycling, recycling, and even I think they call it downcycling, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, there are opportunities there. But what I wanted to highlight was, if you think about the ESG um, hype cycle for fashion, mm -hmm. I think the conversation, and I'm no fashion expert, used to be primarily around how clothes are made, mm -hmm. which is important. And what I'm seeing a shift to is not how they're made, but then once we have them, how we use them and where they go. And I don't think that story is told yet as well, mm. but I'm pleased with the question because it shows that you know, the audience, people are beginning to think through, mm. not just, am I buying sustainably? Was this made in a sweatshop mm. in Bangladesh? Mm. And where did it come from? And it's ESG provenance, mm -hmm. but what about the, the afterlife mm. and the on life? And I think that's important, and I'd love to see, and I don't know whether this exists already, but I'd love to see big fashion um, happily receiving clothes back for upcycling. They are starting. Yeah, of course. 
yes, no, that's counterintuitive yeah. maybe to profit, mm. but those brands that do that will be the ones that survive over the long term because yeah, they'll they be on the right side of history. And they have customer loyalty and they then take co-custodianship and we will come on to this afternoon. I think to the last point to make on that, uh, the lady who asked the question was, there's a factor that's starting to get a lot of exploration in this space called emotional longevity. So a garment can be made well, it can be made to resist a lot of wear, a lot of washes and all of that. But if you've got emotional longevity, which is you don't buy something because you're like, I feel like I need a black V-neck. I'll, that's probably fine. I could do that one. Then if I don't like it in a few years, I'll get another one. But we all have pieces, I'm sure, that, and I, I know we all do, that when you do have to do a wardrobe clear it or you're moving house, you're like, should I get rid of it? No, I, that, that one I would keep if my house is on fire. When you have that emotional, sentimental relationship with a piece, you look after it, you care for it, and eventually you may resell it, but you'd be much more reluctant to. And so emotional longevity, when you shop, whether it's secondhand or not, but particularly secondhand, is one of the keys to not just buying something that's kind of, will I love it, will I not? I think it does the job, but like, does it set my heart on fire? Yeah. You know, or is it just something I will use again and again because it's a really good staple? It ha you have to be invested in it yourself emotionally, and then, then you really do care. You know. Is there anything else? So I'm very mindful that we're probably at time. Yeah, we are. Thank you, Teresa, very much indeed. Thank you.